Hi, my name's uh, Dave Irvin Holiday. I'm I'm a Light of the World University professor at the University of Calgary in Alberta, Canada. And along with my wife, I'm I'm the co-founder of, of Light of the World. Dave, could you explain the core philosophy of the Light of the World Foundation? Yeah, the core philosophy of Light of the World is is basically to facilitate the lighting of the homes in the developing world at what we call at the base of the economic pyramid, roughly a quarter to a third of humanity, you know, which is a couple of billion people who have no access to the electrical grid, but therefore they can't have electric lighting. And what, what we've developed over the years is a solid state lighting system based on renewable energy, uh, which is affordable you know, to, to a great percentage of, of this you know, two billion people. And you've been doing this for about 10 years. Mm -hmm. And what was the technical inspiration that convinced you that this was possible? In the beginning, when we first started to think about how could we help people you know, illuminate their lives, and uh, the, the kind of raison d'etre for Light of Order, by the way, it was so that children could read. Because education is everything. If you're educated, there's nothing you can't do. Um, in the, in the beginning, we thought, well, okay, what kind of a bulb are we going to use? And because I have a background in fiber optic research, I knew a lot about diodes. So I thought, maybe we can, we can make a lamp with diodes. And uh, we actually made uh, white light with colored diodes back in 98. But it was, it was, quite, it was pathetic. It, it was not useful. And uh, we just have to thank God for, for Shuji Nakamura and Naichiya, who uh, invented the, the white LED. So at the end of 98, we were fortunate enough to get a few samples from them. And there's no question, that, that was the Eureka moment. When we switched on that first one-tenth of one watt white LED, when we realized that an old guy like me could see to read you know, an 8 by 11 sheet of paper uh, perfectly well, then children would have absolutely no problem. And you don't have to be a rocket scientist to, to appreciate that you chuck a few of these little 0.1 watt diodes together and you've got a lamp. Now you can light up a, a, a table, a small room, and the rest is history, as they say. How can uh, individual scientists and researchers contribute to your efforts? The contribution that researchers and scientists uh, can make to light the world, it, it's, it's probably twofold, is uh, just keep doing what you're doing in terms of renewable energy and solid state lighting of, of all sorts <clears throat> because we're, we're, we're the grateful recipients of all your, your terrific work and, and I, I mean that, we really do look forward to, to, to using you know, better and more efficient and lower cost devices. On, on a kind of a human level, you know, as just ordinary civilians, um, you could help us, you know, anything from donations because Small organizations are always short of money, but a very large majority of this kind of two billion people at the, the base of the pyramid uh, can actually afford, with the help of microcredit, to pay for the systems. So microcredit, is, it's like banking for the poor. So if someone wants to invest, say a couple of hundred dollars, uh, this will go into a microcredit agency who will then lend that money so the poor person can purchase the system then they pay back at the same rate that they were spending on kerosene. And, and as I showed in my talk this morning, there's many, many countries where we've got really good data that show people are, are spending 100, 150, even, even more than 200 US dollars a year on kerosene. For 200 dollars a year, you can basically pay for our system in a year. And that includes a fair rate of interest. And what has the price of oil uh, increasing done to this economic equation? Yeah, we've, we've discussed, like everybody else, the, the rising and falling and rising and rising cost of oil. And it's a kind of a bittersweet sort of situation. We know it, it's affecting our lives a little, but I mean, our lives, I mean, tradition over North America, our lives are hardly touched to be to be quite frank, but it's really going to affect the poor people uh, drastically because many, many of these people are already spending 20, 30% of their income 
which is only you know, a few hundreds of dollars uh, a year in many cases um, total. The, uh, so it's going to affect them to purchase kerosene. But um, maybe the good thing, in a sense, you know, it's an ill wind that, that blows no good, is that this, this will be an even greater incentive uh, for us and for them to, to come together so that we can show them that, look, your kerosene cost is going up, our, our prices, hopefully, and costs are going down. So to make the move from fuel-based or kerosene-based lighting to solid-state lighting, renewable energy-based, it's, it's, it's a no-brainer. Could you just talk for a minute about how uh, renewable energy and solid-state lighting work together and maybe what you're looking forward to uh, in, in developments in that area? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> The, the match between renewable energy and, and solid-state lighting, I mean, it's beautiful. I mean, the technology for solar panels and for LEDs, there's a lot of kind of commonality there. But we, we have a fairly broad horizon in terms of uh, renewable energy. I mean, we've used, you know, peak, Pico Hydro, just a few hundred or a thousand watts. We're, we're very interested in uh, biomass. We've done a lot of work in the field in, in that. But there's so many things, and uh, we, we kind of just look forward to the, you know, the, the scientists, engineers, developers, etc. Um, just keeping going the way they're going, and, and doing something useful for the world, for the world, because energy is everything. It, it really is.